thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shuka, and uh, thank the Campbell Foundation for making this possible. And uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out. Uh, we don't see this much enthusiasm among our students at Millsaps for this. <laughs> so, uh, I hope some of you, uh, when you finish here, uh, might consider going on at our school. Uh, anyway, uh, so I, uh, I was asked by Dr. Uh, Schufeld to talk about uh, Churchill and leadership. Of course, everyone knows Churchill, they've heard the name, uh, but most of us aren't going to have a chance to lead uh, a country, let alone uh, the free countries of the world. Uh, so is there anything from his career and the way he approached his life and decision making and running the organizations that he did uh, that can be of relevance to us that we might be able to put into practice? So I want to talk about Churchill from that perspective. Uh, what can Churchill do for us? Um, and here's this, uh, these fancy little transitions that Mac computers make possible. Very well. <laughs> yeah, prepare to be wild here. Okay. There you go. Uh, you know, this is modern historians want to explain things in terms of uh, great movements of social forces and large impersonal uh, uh, tech movements of tectonic plates where individuals are simply the, uh, the epiphenomenal, sort of ride on the crest of great historical waves. Uh, this was not always the case with historians. Historians used to have something called the great man theory, uh, which is now sort of derided by modern historians. But if there's one person who stands out as a challenge to that theory, as an example of an individual human being who can change the course of history, I think most historians would agree it is Winston Churchill. As I'm sure you all know, there was this thing called World War II. I, you know, I, I have to tell you, I've been teaching undergraduates. Nothing makes you feel older than talking to 19-year-olds. Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, I'm sure you're aware of this World War II thing, uh, about 60 million people died, and uh, the contest was a genuinely uh, ideological one, a contest between two entirely different ways of life. Uh, when you ask American students when World War, the dates of World War II, uh, well, first of all, they'll ask you, what's World War II? And, but uh, the, 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 they're usually giving you the dates 1941 to 1945. Uh, in the rest of the world, World War II started in 1939. And it very well might have ended in 1940, but for one man. Uh, Adolf Hitler invaded France uh, on, on May 10th. And within 14 days, his troops were uh, on the borders of Paris. World War I, the troops, the, the armies would move barely uh, 100 feet uh, in a month. But here, Hitler's army had, uh, after already uh, destroying uh, Poland and uh, the countries of Eastern Europe and bringing them under its heel, had virtually conquered France within a couple of weeks. And it was during this period of time that humanity faced a turning point, a turning point that we've really forgotten about. Because all of the smart, realist, reasonable people and leaders in Great Britain uh, wanted to make a deal with Hitler. And what we forget, because we know what happened, what we found out about Hitler after the war with the death camps and this bureaucratized mass murder, uh, we can't imagine it. We just assume that World War II was a fight to the death from the beginning. But it wasn't in 1940. In 1940, Hitler was making a reasonable offer to the British. You keep your empire, we'll keep Europe. And the British, who had come into the war so unprepared, with a tiny army of 200,000 men facing millions. Uh, without the war equipment, they were trying to you know, find the stuff they had left over from World War I and uh, see if they could fix it up. They, they were in a terribly weak position. They were alone in the world, as you can see from this map. And, uh, and Hitler didn't really want to invade Great Britain. He wanted Great Britain to be uh, weak and uh, pliant to his will. But most of the, the smart money was on ending the war uh, making a deal with Hitler, uh, except for one man, uh, the man who became prime minister, uh, Winston Churchill. And in doing so, uh, he, he made the war, this, this crusade and this fight to the finish, this total war that, that we are familiar with in history. But he also 
turned the British public around and mobilized people, uh, got everyone in the, in the public to get behind the war effort. And so a lot of Britain's war effort wasn't even directed by the government. It was people volunteering to build, uh, uh, to, to build defense measures and uh, volunteering to work at the factories. And uh, Britain's army, which was stranded in, uh, in France uh, as, Hitler's army, as Hitler's tanks had cut it off, uh, was rescued uh, not primarily by British naval ships, but by private citizens, just getting in boats and sometimes even rowing across the channel to pick uh, British soldiers up from the beach, who, again, you know, the experts had considered would be lost uh, this, from the beaches of Dunkirk, uh, which I'm sure you might have heard of. And uh, uh, finally, <laughs> Churchill changed the actions of the British government and mobilized the, the British departments of war uh, to, to produce uh, prodigious amounts of weapons and to put together a large army in record time. And this is something we uh, often forget about Churchill, it's often overlooked. He was a terrific manager and he really whipped the uh, British bureaucracy into shape and uh, put together things in incre with incredible speed, uh, got things done faster than anybody had believed they could be done. So uh, this, is, this is the person we're, uh, we're talking about. So we want to see uh, what can we learn from him as a, as a public speaker, uh, as a politician and decision maker, uh, as a manager, and as a human being, as a man, uh, from his character. And I think there's great lessons in, in all of these things for us. For, for, for uh, Churchill's accomplishments, he's known for his oratory. Uh, and uh, I was trying to get the sound set up here. We, uh, we, I, it, we just had a little uh, bad luck getting our two systems working together. But you can go online. All of Churchill's speeches are actually online and uh, collected now, so you can hear them. Uh, his, his speeches, uh, when he came into office in those first uh, two weeks where he made, a, he made a speech that night and he made a speech uh, two weeks later, are, are, are legendary. And his use of the English language was uh, legendary throughout the English-speaking world. And they had a tremendous influence in, in the uh, occupied Europe, where people had, before Churchill came in, they had assumed that you know, Hitler had won and they were, they were done for. Uh, it gave people hope throughout the world. Uh, and it was particularly uh, important in its influence on the British people. So I think when you first hear Churchill, it's a bit of a surprise. Uh, he speaks very slowly, and he has a noticeable speech impediment. Uh, I think what made the speeches so effective was the actual logical content of the speeches. And so it was the actual arguments that he used rather than his delivery. And uh, why is it going backwards? Wow. It's never done this before. Well, I'm, uh, we're going to... You want me to try to punch up the speech on other system? Or... Um, I don't have the clip I would want to refer to, that's but if you could, fine. if you want to find the uh, the, the finest hour okay. speech or the uh, first speech on becoming prime minister, okay, here we are. Oh. One of the things I have to realize about Churchill's rhetoric is uh, it's not rhetoric to him. Some of the passages that we look on as sort of decorative are not uh, rhetorical flourishes in Churchill's mind. They're actually at the center of his theory of uh, of how the world works and of what Britain is. And in particular, he, ha he makes these uh, references to history. Uh, and one of the most famous lines uh, you might know in his uh, second speech as prime minister on the radio, uh, tells everyone we're facing this terrible ordeal. So what we should do, uh, said, so let us bear ourselves so that Britain and her empire should last for a thousand years. Men will still say this was their finest hour. Uh, this is only one of many examples where Churchill looks back at history for and uh, to use to inspire people. Uh, most people who talk about rhetoric today, you hear to politicians talking about what's some great thing that's going to happen in the future. Churchill almost always focuses on the great things we have done as a people in the past as a way to inspire us and to set an example for us to, to monitor. And it's interesting, he, uh, well, uh, he, he refers to a lot of his speak, uh, people in history. This is his uh, own ancestor, the Duke of Marlborough, uh, who was uh, born John Churchill and created the Duke of Marlborough after he became the greatest uh, British general of the uh, 18th century. 
so he had a great connection with uh, British history, but he's, he treats King Arthur as if he were a real person, and his deeds were things we should actually have a duty to emulate. Uh, and he, he speaks to the British people as if they're part of this story of a heroic race that has a message to bring to mankind, this message of freedom in the Magna Carta, and uh, the idea of freedom under law, and what we're doing, we're fighting to uh, bring that message uh, through the world, uh, and it's the same thing that's made us a people throughout history. And so this is appeal to history and identity is at the center of uh, Churchill's speeches. And I don't know, you're, you're, you're probably not going to face, uh, be a part of an organization where you're facing annihilation, uh, but everyone can, you can think you can apply this to an organization you might be in. Instead of talking about what you're going to do in the future, talk about what we've done in the past and uh, the characteristics that have made us great in the past and use them as an example to inspire people and to hold themselves accountable to in the uh, present. Uh, another thing that I think is extremely uh, striking about Churchill's rhetoric is he's extremely frank about bad news. Uh, it's, it's incredible to hear the things that Churchill tells people uh, in, in, in the, uh, where the, when this war is going so badly. So their ally France has been conquered essentially in two weeks and suddenly they're alone in the world facing this invincible military machine. And people are worried. They've been told uh, throughout the 1930s that the bomber will always get through. And we, you know, with the nuclear weapons that we have today, we think of this as pretty, you know, pretty light, light stuff. But in the minds of people in the 1930s, the idea was a bomber would get through somehow anyway, and there's no way to stop them from coming through. So eventually they could destroy entire peoples and cities. So they, they, they thought of the uh, new bomber airplanes as essentially like we think of nuclear weapons, things that can destroy entire cities and make, uh, you know, make the entire population the target rather than just uh, people in the war. And so what a, what a, a typical leader might do is talk about the good news uh, and talk, be optimistic and try to downplay the bad news. Churchill does the exact opposite. And uh, his first two speeches as prime minister are, he, he mentions some amazingly grim facts. Uh, his first speech in Parliament says, we have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind, uh, with hardship and sorrow our only garment. Uh, in the famous phrase, I have nothing to offer you but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. And it's not just in Parliament where he's as frank about the difficulties that they face. It's in his radio addresses to people. Uh, and it's, it's uh, a couple of striking things. People, you know, it, this, is, this is before we have, uh, you know, television and everything. So people are kind of wondering what's going on in France. They hear these terrible stories. But they're not quite sure what to believe. Uh, is it really true that these German tanks have penetrated and have actually, you know, gotten near the Atlantic Ocean? And Churchill had a choice. He could have lied to people or covered up the truth or just been vague, but he actually tells them the worst news that the Germans had pierced through uh, with these remarkable new combinations of armor and air power and are now behind our lines by 100 miles. Uh, and then he does something that's quite striking. He says, but you know, if they're behind our lines, we're also behind theirs. And if they're going to be able to cause trouble for us, we can cut their lines of supply off too. So they're actually very vulnerable. And you think about that, I mean, it's kind of the first thing you think about, or I thought about when I heard that, it was reminded of Jefferson Davis's uh, famous statement uh, when Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy, spell, uh, fell. Does anybody remember this? He said, uh, Relieved from the necessity of guarding cities and particular points, our army can now be free to maneuver against the enemy. I mean, this is, <laughs> you know, I mean, you could have, you could have reacted to Churchill's statement, oh, good, they pierced our lines by 100 miles, but now that means we're behind their lines too. I mean, that's, you could easily make fun of that, but Churchill uh, got away with it. Uh, and so why? Why was he able to, uh, to get away with uh, telling people such terrible things? Uh, he also doesn't downplay the uh, possibility of uh, civilians getting killed. Uh, and he, he says, uh, the thing I remember most in his first speech to uh, Parliament, he talks about the problem of air raids, that because Germany hasn't started bombing yet, but it's certainly going to happen. And he says, uh, 
There will be many men and women in this island who, when the ordeal comes upon them, as come it will, will feel a comfort and even a pride that they are sharing the perils of our lads at the front, soldiers, seamen, and airmen, God bless them, and are drawing away from them a part, at least, of the onslaught they have to bear. What an amazing thing to tell people. Notice, his argument is, is, underneath his argument is saying, look, we've got soldiers dying at the front. So I know it's bad for you, but whatever, however bad it is for you, it's worse for them. But he doesn't make the argument. He assumes that the British people are a part of this heroic race that have a message for mankind, and he simply addresses them on the assumption that they are heroic people and they will accept this suffering and... Uh, it will only increase their resolve. And they'll only be happy that they're drawing some of this uh, pressure from the front. And by addressing people as if he expects them to act heroically, uh, somehow they do. Um, well, and again, you know, just imagine a leader in our day, if after you know, September 11th, you know, what, you know, what we were told after September 11th, don't worry, go to Disneyland, get on an airplane. You know, This is... Uh, uh, this is the exact opposite from the approach Churchill took. Uh, I think the other line that is so striking to me, uh, his plan for when the Germans actually invaded Great Britain was they didn't have... This is, he made up these plans before they had gotten their army back from Dunkirk. But even with that army, they had a tiny army. You know, Britain is, had an empire, but the soldiers were all actually out in the empire. And uh, this is characteristic of Great Britain for uh, centuries, that it had virtually no army. In fact, through a lot of its history, it had zero standing army. The only you know, soldiers, full-time soldiers, were the king's personal guards. Uh, and uh, so anyway, they were just going to actually, you know, civilians were going to have to do the job of fighting these professional German soldiers. And uh, it's, it's a terrible thing to contemplate. Uh, his slogan that he planned for the battle was, you can always take one with you. <laughs> and think about this, you're admitting to your people, your government can't protect you, we can't stop you from getting killed, but at least you can have the satisfaction of killing one of them as you die. What kind of person would, would, would say this? And you know, we think about you know, our politicians today, always trying to sugarcoat things and won't tell us any bad news, and they want to find out what we want to hear. They're constantly polling and uh, doing focus groups to find out what they should say. Uh, Churchill was the exact opposite. Uh, how did that work? Uh, well, I think I, I want to come back to this question. I think part of the answer uh, to why Churchill could say this sort of thing and be believed and strengthen his position because of saying this sort of thing uh, was because of his career and his reputation of sticking to his convictions no matter what the cost was to him personally. And this is, uh, gets us into uh, Churchill's career as a politician, uh, but this is, I think, relevant to any decision maker. Uh, Churchill would, was a self-educated man. He, uh, uh, if any of you ever seen the, the movie Young Churchill or Young Winston, uh, it's, it's quite extraordinary. He was, uh, you know, he had a terrible career in school, and it took him uh, you know, three tries to even get into military school, and he was just a terrible student. Uh, and then suddenly, you know, when he's 24 years old and hanging around in India, India as a soldier, he decides to start reading, and he educates himself in the course of a couple of years, uh, reading all this history and becoming uh, this tremendously well-informed person. But it's entirely self-taught, and it's entirely self-directed. And so he had no one to tell him, you know, this is what everybody reads now, and this is this this book everyone knows. No one thinks this book is any good, you know, and this is this is what everybody thinks about this now. He confronted all these ancient historians, you know, from the Roman historians to Edward Gibbons to contemporary writers, and he made his own judgments about all of them, uh, without any guidance from anyone. Uh, and he stuck to them. He would make a judgment independent of what other people thought, and he would stick to it and defend that con conviction, no matter how much opposition there was to it. And we've all been in this position. You know how difficult it is to be in a minority. Yep. Are you? Oh. I got my department head. Pull, pull out that door and bite that department head. 
Any anyone wants to come in here? We just, sorry. <laughs> so. Uh, that is not an interruption, by the way. What was I? You can come anytime you want. Oh yeah, yeah. So sticking to your convictions uh, when you're in the minority, this is something that Churchill does, and it's something that had both helped his career and hurt his career. And uh, oh, that was uh, some things about his uh, speeches. This is uh, this is practical advice. You can use a lot of the things we learn from Churchill's speeches in your own speeches. I think. Uh, I want to go on. Okay. So as a politician, he would stick to his convictions, and uh, we all know how he. Uh, went into the political wilderness because he took unpopular positions in the 1930s. We all know about how he warned about Hitler throughout the 1930s and was pretty much moved out of uh, political power because of that. And he went from being a person that everyone, he went from being a, a, a tremendously successful politician having held almost every major office of state by the age of 50 and being assumed to be the next prime minister to being someone who uh, couldn't even get people to come in and listen to his speech when he uh, spoke in Parliament. And we just have to face a few people laughing and talking to each other while he spoke. He just hit complete bottom uh, in the 1930s because of his warnings about Hitler. But we often forget that what actually got him into the political wilderness in the first place was his position on Indian independence. He was against Indian independence, and he fought that issue long past the point any prudent politician would have fought it. And it uh, really, that's what got him on the outs with the Conservative Party. Uh, probably most of us think he was wrong on that issue, understandably. But he did make a, an important argument. He said that if, you, if we give India independence, there will be ethnic strife and uh, tens of thousands of people will be killed. And that, unfortunately, was true. There were about, uh, within the first two weeks of Indian independence, about 200,000 people uh, died in ethnic strife. So he was... He was wrong, but he did have something right in that. Uh, but anyway, uh, we see how he uh, sticks to his convictions when it costs him a lot. It also, though, helped him a lot. Uh, one of his convictions was free trade. He viewed free trade not only as, a, as good economic sense, he viewed it as a moral issue because uh, free trade uh, made it possible for working uh, class people to buy goods cheaply. And so he was adamant on the issue of free trade. It, really got him more or less kicked out of the Conservative Party. But by sticking to that issue, uh, when a couple of years later the political winds changed, uh, he was uh, swept into power and the very fact that he had stuck to this issue when it was so unpopular actually helped him and uh, in made him more powerful in the Liberal Party which he joined. And uh, we forget his meteoric rise. He was uh, the youngest minister uh, in, in history when he uh, entered office, age 29. And uh, by 1911, he was the first Lord of the Admiralty. Uh, and then he later goes on to have uh, virtually every other ministry except for the foreign ministry. So he has a tremendously successful career, uh, in part uh, to because of sticking to his convictions. And so uh, I, going back to why he could say things that a normal politician would not dare to tell people, I think it's in large part because he had this reputation for st sticking to his convictions, saying what he believed, no matter what, what the cost, that people would believe him when he said that you know, the Germans penetrating our lines by 100 miles actually had some good points to it. Uh, and so this is, uh, and I think this is a lesson for us uh, when we're in the minority, but we really think that we're right about something. Uh, Good, rational people will tell us, why don't you know, you know, kind of uh, trim your sails and kind of get, get with the program. Uh, Churchill's example is uh, kind of the opposite. And I think of him as, uh, and, and in the short term it cost him dearly, but in the long term it actually paid off in, in, in tremendous ways. And it, it reminds me of a, uh, a business uh, writer, a man named uh, Nasib Talim, Taleb, he wrote uh, a book called *The Black Swan*. Uh, well, he's a he's a investor and a mathematician and a really good writer. But his career, he the key to his thinking is that uh, catastrophes happen on a regular basis. Every twenty or thirty years, some big financial catastrophe happens, 
Uh, but the problem is that you know, people ignore it until it happens. During that 20 or 30 years when there's no catastrophe, people think everything's fine, and so they try to maximize their returns based on the assumption that you know, the 20 years that things have been good are going to continue indefinitely. He always assumed that catastrophe was going to happen sometime. Might be tomorrow, might be 40 years from now, but it's going to happen, and so what you should do is invest with an eye towards weathering that catastrophe and making, uh, making profits out of that. And so he went through long years, sometimes decades, of being derided by other investment advisors because he's, not, he's missing all these opportunities. But then when there's a catastrophe that comes, this, you know, the savings and loan crisis in 1991 and uh, the 1999 stock market crash with the uh, tech stocks and uh, obviously 2008, he was positioned to actually uh, really do well and in the long run actually does much better than, his, uh, than, the other, uh, than the people who seemed smarter at the time. And so I think this, uh, this Churchill strategy of, uh, in a sense, making a long bet is something that can be applied to a wide range of uh, human activities and decisions. Uh, I want to talk about two more things. Uh, yeah, uh, let's see. I would like to talk about Churchill's character. Another thing that's striking about Churchill's career is that uh, he has a lot of fights, but after the fight is over, he's very magnanimous. Uh, the most striking example of this is again in 1940 when he takes office. There's a large cry from uh, the British public and in the parliament to uh, excise the guilty men, as they were called. The people who had made these stupid deals with Hitler and had been the voices of appeasement. And Churchill cuts this off completely. As famous, famously said on the floor of Parliament, if we allow the present to open a quarrel with the past, we may lose the future. But he cut this kind of a discussion of what had happened in the past and who had made mistakes in the past off absolutely completely. And, he, he, and this was characteristic of him. He would have these tremendous fights political fights with people, but when it was over, whether he'd won or lost, you know, if he won, he'd be magnanimous. If he had lost, he would uh, try to, you know, he would congratulate the winner and not let, take it personally. Uh, even in the India fight, you know, after he had lost the India fight, he said, well, I've, I've lost, and he invited the Indian uh, spokesman for the Congress party over to lunch, and they became fast friends. Uh, so this magnanimity that Churchill has is a tremendous a lesson we can all learn and apply to any organization that we're in. Uh, he's also extremely loyal when he's on the team. And this was another thing that's sort of come to light in recent years as we look at his career. Uh, he was a tremendous critic of the government when he was outside of the government. But then in 1939, when war becomes inevitable, Neville Chamberlain invites him into the parliament. And Everyone tells Neville Chamberlain, don't do this because he's your greatest political enemy and he'll use everything he learns being in the cabinet to undermine you and take your job. Nothing could have been further from the truth. Uh, once Churchill was on the team, he was loyal to Neville, Neville Chamberlain and wouldn't even allow people to say bad but true things about Neville Chamberlain in his presence. Uh, and, you know, you can look through the historical records, all you find are his, his friends uh, frustrated that Churchill won't do more to advance his own career. And uh, he won't do this because he's, he believes in loyalty and being a loyal team member. And, and so this is, again, people thought this was very de detrimental to his career when he could have made a move against Neville Chamberlain very easily during the two years he's in the cabinet. Uh, but once he becomes the leader of the organization, then he's able to command loyalty uh, at a much higher level than he would have if he had sort of been uh, engaged in this Machiavellian maneuvering himself. Um, <coughs> now, a last, uh, uh, one aspect of Churchill's career that I don't think gets enough attention is his, uh, his ability as a manager. Uh, we always think of Churchill as being a great orator and that's why he's so famous, uh, but Actually, the reason his career kept getting revived uh, is because the government of the day would need somebody who could manage this ministry or get this ministry into shape or get this uh, operation to get its budget cut. He, keep, he keeps getting brought back in to shape up an organization. 
And this is really kind of surprising because if you're, you're familiar at all with Churchill's personal life, it's just, uh, it seems chaotic. Uh, no one, uh, he, you know, he, he sleeps till 10 in the morning. He begins his day with a glass of whiskey uh, to wash down his eggs and bacon. He, he goes to sleep for an hour in the afternoon, and then he'll stay up till 4 in the morning. And, uh, and he has no, no respect for anyone else's sense of time, too. You know, he'll just call anybody at any hour of the day. Uh, and he's, uh, he's a great budget cutter, but he himself is always on the edge of bankruptcy his entire life and actually has to be bailed out by rich friends a, a couple of points in his life. Uh, so why was he such a good manager of organizations? Uh, when he really behaves in the exact opposite way uh, that a management, uh, you know, management uh, teachers would tell you to behave. Uh, and I'm not quite sure uh, that I know the answer to this. But uh, there's a couple of hints. One is that he works extremely hard. I'm sorry to tell you this. I wish it were like he was Ronald Reagan and he could just amazingly get other people to do things and then only work four hours a day, but that's just not true. Uh, <laughs> Churchill uh, worked constantly, and during World War II there was no difference between being awake and working for Churchill. And he, yeah, you would often say, you know, sleeping for an hour and an afternoon and having the siesta allowed him to get a day and a half's work into one day. And it's, it's really true. He uh, just worked tremendously hard. Uh, another thing that he does is uh, he, he doesn't respect authority. Uh, he doesn't respect organizational boundaries, and he doesn't respect expertise. Oh, that's not exactly. He doesn't defer to it. Uh, he, he won't let an organizational boundary or someone's expertise in an area stop him from coming to his own independent judgment and forcing them you know, to justify themselves in terms he can understand. And this is something so many people, when they're, you know, they're faced with an expert on a subject, or uh, the expert explains things and uses words that they don't understand, you know, they kind of defer to them. I, I find myself, you know, I'm learning statistics, and I kind of clam up after a few big words come out, you know, because I don't want to show that I don't know what's going on. Churchill didn't care. He didn't care if people used words he didn't understand, it was their fault. And he said, you know, he was, if you, if you really knew what you were talking about, you'd be able to put it in plain English. And it's because of this that he actually uh, ends up uh, being, uh, knowing things that other people don't know. Uh, he was actually in instrumental in getting radar developed uh, in the 1930s. He was, uh, he was one of the prime movers behind getting the uh, Britain's atomic bomb program started, which was actually what got ours started. Um, and he was also, uh, he was instrumental in uh, supporting the mathematici mathematicians at Bletchley Park who broke the German codes. Uh, all of these things, these, these are subjects he didn't personally know anything about, but he had a way of making experts you know, talk to him and explain what's really going on until he understood it and was confident in his own judgment about the issue. And this is why during World War II, you know, he, this, this talk of civilians not interfering with generals, that had no place in Churchill's mind. You know, if he disagreed with the general, he would fire them like that, you know. Uh, and this is a great, uh, in World War II, in World War I, the, uh, there had been this, uh, everyone, everyone was told, you know, you have to refer to the generals. So they let the generals fight their war, and these idiotic generals kept, you know, calling up horse charges against machine guns, you know, for four years. It was just idiocy. Uh, well, there was none of that in World War II. Churchill was always ready to not only overrule a general, but tell them, I have a better idea. And it's not always that he was, his ideas were good. Some of them were utterly ridiculous. There's this great scene uh, in, in, in where he's, uh, he's got the British high command in his bathroom, gathered around his bathtub, and he's in his bathrobe, and I got this chunk of ice in there, and he's explaining how we can, we can get icebergs and tow them down and use them as aircraft carriers. And this, you know, he got the British High Command out to his bath in his bathrobe at two in the morning to explain this. But okay, some of his other ideas that he actually one of his ideas was the uh, floating harbors that actually worked and were one of the keys to success in D-Day. So he had a lot of ideas. Some of them were ridiculous. Some of them were great. But he always thought for himself, and he he never let experts you know shut him up. Uh, and finally, the last thing I think is key to his management style is he put everything in writing. If, you, if you're familiar with this period, you know, you can contrast Churchill, uh, almost diametrically opposed with uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Roosevelt never put anything in writing because if he put something in writing, he had to take responsibility for it. And uh, he also liked 
he'd like to be able to tell people what they wanted to hear, and he would actually create uh, confusion and have, say, two subordinates thinking they're both in charge of the same thing, pursuing uh, you know, different programs, precisely and intentionally so that when they had a conflict, they'd have to come to him to settle it. So he, he used this uh, you know, being vague and not putting anything on paper as a conscious strategy for managing the organization. Churchill was the exact opposite. In fact, the first day he's prime minister, he sends out a memo, memo uh, to everybody in the government. The prime minister wishes it known that the prime minister takes no responsibility for anything uh, that is purported to be an order of his if it is not in writing. And so anything that I, I, any order I give has to be in writing or put into writing as soon as possible. And it's really true. It's, it, everything he uh, does is in writing. He has uh, two teams of stenographers who follow him around even when he takes a bath. Someone's there with a notepad and he's dictating something. Uh, and what he dictates are memos to anyone. Uh, he, he has no respect for lines of authorities. He'll, you know, he'll write a memo to somebody who's working on a, in a factory or in charge of you know, the tiniest thing, uh, asking them, why are you doing this? And uh, his, so his memos would go to anyone. And this is uh, exactly the contrary to what they tell you in business school, right? You're supposed to give someone a job and delegate to them and let them do their job. Churchill had no sense of this. He would, anything he thought was wrong, he'd send out a memo and ask, why are you doing this? And explain why you're doing this. And uh, the, one of the reasons his memos were very effective is because they always had a specific action that was requested and they always had a particular date attached to them. And so uh, there was no way to avoid, you know, here's this document saying you have to do this and by a certain date, even if it was just replying to a, a question. Uh, and this is striking to me. I've, I've been a student of American government and, uh, and the American presidency. And one of the things that is always said about the president is uh, that, you know, it's almost impossible for him to get things done, uh, say, with the military. You know, because the military's procedures and standard operating procedures are so strong, even the president can't get them to veer from them. There's a great story during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, president Kennedy would fly over the uh, Andrews Air Force Base, and he'd see all the planes clumped together uh, in, in one place. And he said, why don't they spread those planes out? That's crazy. They could all just be destroyed with one bomb. And he gave this order several times. But the military had a standard operating procedure of putting them all in one place uh, to guard against sabotage. And direct presidential orders couldn't get them out of this. Uh, well, Churchill gets around this problem by never giving verbal orders and never respecting the chain of command. He'll put his orders in writing, or his, he calls them requests, but you know, from the prime minister. You know, uh, they're actually called his prayers because he'd say, pray tell me why such and such happens. Uh, but he, but they, you know, Churchill would have written a memo, uh, dictated a memo in the helicopter. It didn't. They had helicopters, but he didn't ride in a helicopter. But he'd have dictated a memo in the helicopter and addressed it to the commander of that, that base. And you know, the issue would have been resolved because he does everything in writing and forces things to be resolved. And I think this is something anyone in any organization can uh, do, uh, even a teacher. I've started making my syllabi much more explicit after reading about Churchill, you know, because I realized so many of the discussions I have with students are about you know, what was required or what I really asked for in this assignment and everything. You know, so I, I've, it's helped me in my own life, and I'm not even, I'm just running a classroom, let alone a country. Um, and so anyway, that's, uh, I think Churchill as a, ma as a manager is a sort of undiscovered resource. Oh, there's this couple of things. He always, he worked standing up. He had a standing mm -hmm. desk, as Dr. Uh, Dr. Schufeld uh, informed me. Uh, this is uh, an example of one of his memos. And then finally, uh, his, all of his memos had a tag coding at what date they were supposed to be answered by and you know, when you were supposed to do something. And, and the highest level was uh, the ones that would get this red tag action this day. Um, so let's see. Uh, finally, I think we can learn a lot from uh, Winston Churchill's character and his, uh, his magnanimity, his loyalty, his uh, uh, belief in his convictions, and uh, his ability to pick himself up after he fails. Uh, one of my favorite quotes of Winston Churchill says, success is the ability to move from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> Could also be a description of failure too, but nonetheless. Um, and this is, this is the amazing thing. You know, what's so amazing about Churchill is not what he did during the war, it's what he did when he failed. Uh, so when he was, uh, 
when he uh, was kicked out of government because of the disastrous Dardanelles campaign in, in World War I, uh, he just it, he didn't, didn't waste a couple of days. He joined the army to fight on the front instead of just sitting around in parliament and complaining and trying to explain why he was right. You know, uh, he, he, you know, he took, every time he failed, he just would try harder. And I think that's something that uh, we can all learn, uh, learn from and benefit from. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll just, uh, I'll, I don't know, I think I'm going to stop there. Yeah, yeah, well, this is, so these are sort of things we can learn from Churchill's personal life uh, that, that you might find useful. And I think that's pretty much what I had prepared. What did I say? Did I say something funny? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, everyone talks about how terrible Churchill's health habits were. Um, and it's a, you know, he, he would, the actual, the thing he drank in the morning wasn't really whiskey. It was, it's a habit he picked up in India. They would, they, in, in, in India, you know, instead of drinking straight water, you'd have a little bit of whiskey in there to, you know, kill any bacteria, which we're living in. So he wasn't getting drunk at 10 a.m. Uh, and his cigars, you know, you always see him with a cigar and it's, oh, it's a terrible thing, smoking cigars. He actually, you know, he, his cigars would actually end the day almost as long as they were when they started the day. They'd just go out and he'd forget about them and have them in his mouth all the, t all the time. So he didn't, he didn't smoke as much as he appeared he did. Uh, the, the eating, on the other hand, uh, that's all true. But uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, well that's, that's my sort of prepared remarks. So. We uh, have any questions? Um, we can field them now. If you, if you have a comment, I understand some of you. We do not have a class in here.